Amen. It is good to be with you, uh, Nawada Methodist Church and Delaware Methodist Church. Thank you all for coming together this morning. Uh, my name is James Lambert, and I'm a friend of Jeffrey and Sarah Beth, and I'm happy to be here filling in for both of them today. Um, and uh, y- y'all are good singers. You know how to sing. I'm so happy. You know, I, that, that always makes a musician happy when they're playing the music and they're not alone and you hear the voices praising God. And uh, I, know that, I know that Jeffrey and Sarah Beth are passionate about hymns and singing, so I'm not surprised uh, to find their church uh, knowing how to sing. So um, I am one of the pastors at Asbury uh, Church in Tulsa. Uh, of course, until recently, a United Methodist Church, just like y'all were. And these are um, trying times, but really exciting times in, uh, in Methodism, in that movement of people influenced by John Wesley. Um, there are churches popping up everywhere. Um, you know, there, there is opposition. Uh, there are churches that are disaffiliating, and there are churches that are not disaffiliating. But there are churches that are starting. The Lord is planting churches just here and there all around the nation, uh, and then there are other groups throughout the world, um, little pockets of, of Methodist people that are saying, we want to join uh, the, the, the global Methodist church. And, but not all the churches uh, are GMC, of course, that are starting. There's just the, the spirits doing amazing things everywhere. So uh, I'm happy to be with you all, uh, Nawada and Delaware, and encourage you this morning. The Holy Spirit is moving among you. God's not done with you. Amen. He has work for you in this community, in your towns, uh, among your neighbors. He has work for you, and the best is yet to come. So we're reading uh, 1 Corinthians this morning, reading 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And uh, y'all have been reading all the way through 1 Corinthians chapter by chapter. And uh, I'm not used to that style of preaching, but I'm really happy to practice it today. Uh, This is is fun. Just get to read a whole chapter. So uh, I will read part, and then I'll comment on part, and I hear that's how Jeffrey does it, and so I'm going to do what y'all are used to this morning. And uh, so we have 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 1. Feel free to follow along in, in, in your Bible or, or just to, to listen. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If I am not an apostle to others, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. That's verses 1 and 2. So most likely Paul wrote this section of 1 Corinthians in response to an inquiry that he received from the Corinthians. Many of the things that Paul wrote were in response to questions that he was asked by letter, and he was trying to settle disputes or provide teaching to resolve issues that they were having. And so um, it, it's, it's hard for me to imagine anyone accusing the Apostle Paul of being a freeloader, but that seems to be what was going on here, the, the context of this saying. Perhaps someone objected to the offerings that he collected, thinking that he was using them for himself. Or perhaps someone thought he consumed too much food and drink when he, was, uh, when he visited Corinth. Who knows? But Paul took the opportunity to write them back and establish a few things, not primarily for his own sake, but for the sake of those workers in the Lord who would follow in his footsteps later on, both in traveling ministry like Paul did and in settled ministry uh, and settled uh, pastoring like many people would after him. Um, So it is, of course, ironic for Paul to use the phrase, if I am not an apostle to others. Because Paul, more than any other apostle, became an apostle to the whole church. Uh, he, he wrote the letters that would make up one-third of the whole New Testament. So Paul's letters became read all over the world, and, and he helped to, to describe the gospel of Christ and, and clarify it and write it down for us to, to read and understand. So he, of course, is an apostle to the whole church of Jesus Christ. But he was saying, at least I'm an apostle to you all. I helped establish your church. You know me. Uh, Listen to what I am saying. I'm going to go on to read 
uh, verse 3 through 7 of 1 Corinthians 9. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to our food and drink? Do we not have the right to be accompanied by a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who at any time pays the expenses for doing military service? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock and does not get any of its milk? So forgive me for finding some humor in the text today, but it seems awfully convenient to me that a visiting pastor would come in to preach on the part about how pastors have a right to be paid for their labors, and on Labor Day weekend, no less. <laughs> but, but really, Pastor Jeffrey told me I could preach on whatever I wanted, uh, but I, I liked the idea of con simply continuing this series on 1 Corinthians because we get our nourishment from, from Scripture. And uh, we never know what we will find there. And so when we don't choose our text, that's, that's a lot of the, the fun part, because we just get to see what is there. And so this is what we find there. The Apostle Paul addressing some disgruntled group within the Corinthian church um, about the rights of an apostle, so that they would stop giving him a hard time about receiving their hospitality. And more importantly, so that he could establish for the future the rights of those who would labor in the Lord's harvest of souls. We keep reading verses 8 through 12. Do I say this on human authority? Does not the law also say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Or does he not speak entirely for our sake? Uh, it was indeed written for our sake, for whoever plows should plow in hopes that uh, plow in hope, and whoever threshes should thresh in hope of a share in the crop. If we have sown spiritual good among you, is it too much if we reap your material benefits? If others share this rightful claim on you, do we not still more? And by we, Paul was speaking of him and Barnabas. And so Paul establishes here that spiritual work, what he calls spiritual good, has value and is indeed just as valuable as physical work, as material goods. And as a side note, this passage also establishes that a given scripture can have more than one level of meaning, more than one application. Uh, we see this especially in prophecy which can have multiple fulfillments through different parts of history. But Paul is demonstrating it with law, with the scriptures of law as well. He asks a rhetorical question. Is it for oxen that God was concerned when he wrote that law? To which the answer seems to be no. God is concerned with us humans. But it's not an either or. God is, in fact, concerned with oxen. He cares about the beasts of the field. He made the law for them. He made the law to tell landowners that they were not the only thing that matter. Uh, that the wild animals and your domesticated animals and your paid laborers and strangers and sojourners in the land and the poor people among you who need to glean from the fields, all of God's creatures matter to God and must be fed. And the, the wide net of God's love and compassion is actually... Uh, the source of God's law. That's why he wrote all those rules for his people, over 600 laws in the Old Testament. He needed to give his people such detailed rules to make sure that everyone and everything is provided for. But, but now back to the main point that Paul is using this text for. Preachers need to eat, just like oxen need to eat. So do not begrudge men and women of God from compensation in money or in kind, so that they may live and prosper and be blessed in a similar manner to the people among whom they labor, the people who are the harvest field of God, the people whose salvation they seek. Now going on to verses 13 and 14, starting actually halfway through verse 12 where we left off. <clears throat> 
Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their (coughs) food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in what is sacrificed on the altar? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Paul gives us new important information here, which may have been clearing up a misunderstanding with some of his original readers. He has not made use of these rights of apostles, meaning that he has not refrained from physical labor, but he has continued to physically work for a living, even while being a traveling preacher and teacher. Also, he is not married. And so he has not brought along a wife or children to be a further burden on the hospitality and provision of the people among whom he works. This doesn't mean that he hasn't received any hospitality at all. It would be hard to understand where this whole conversation even came from if he hadn't received some hospitality, food and drink in people's homes. But he did not rely on that hospitality for his sustenance when he dwelled or sojourned in an area for a period of time. He worked, and he made tents and sold them, as we learn in Acts chapter 18, when he was spending time with some other tent makers. Paul was a tent maker, and so he was able to buy, to buy his own food and clothing as needed. But then just as soon as he tells us that he's not made use of this right himself, he again repeats why the right exists for others. He says it very strongly. The Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. And he uses the example of the Old Testament uh, priests and Levites, who for centuries had been supported by the Jewish people and and who only had two jobs. The priests and Levites had two jobs. One was lead the people in worship, and two was teach the law of God. The priests and the Levites, that's all they did. They led worship and they taught the law of God and their needs were provided for by others. Um, Paul goes on in verses 15 through 17. But I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing this so that they may be applied in my case. Indeed, I would rather die than that. No one will deprive me of my ground for boasting. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting. For an obligation is laid on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that in my proclamation I may make the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel." Now Paul explains his motivations. The flow of his thought from verse to verse can be a little unclear in this part because of some technical terms and the different way that ancient people viewed work and wages uh, than we tend to view them. But the overall point of the passage is clear. Paul could ask for pay for his work, and the payment would be his reward, his wages. But instead, he feels like his calling, his charge from God, is so great and so clear that he, in fact, in some way, has no choice but to preach the gospel. Paul does not feel a freedom to say, okay, I was preaching for a while, now I'm going to go do something else. He has this compulsion he cannot do otherwise. Um, And as the outflow of his passion for the work of Christ he seeks a further reward. He is actually seeking a reward, but the reward that he's seeking is the satisfaction of doing something over and above what he is expected to do. He's actually taking pride in his work, and that pride in this case is not a bad thing. He's saying that if he just carried out his calling for monetary reward, like like he has every right to do, it would not feel right and satisfying to him. But he is not making a rule for everyone. For Paul's part, he wants to make the gospel free of charge, taking down every possible barrier to someone hearing and receiving the good news 
of Jesus. Not all preachers are like Paul. Of course, all preachers, and indeed all Christians, that includes all of you, should desire the salvation of others. That is love. We should love our neighbors and want them to know Jesus. But we don't all have the same kind of drive, and we're not all called to be tent makers, to spend our time preaching but, but not get paid for it. We, we must avoid the error of taking Paul's example as a rule and setting it up to where all Christian preachers and teachers need to be just like Paul or else they aren't legitimate. We must be careful not to do this because Paul himself doesn't do it. Okay, whenever Paul is writing, he, he does this really clearly, but whenever a biblical author is writing and he says, don't get me wrong, like you have to pay attention and don't get him wrong. So he's telling you something about himself. He's bearing his personal testimony here, but he's taking pains to say, this isn't for everybody. This rule's not for everybody. Um, so uh, let's see. He's saying that the normal situation is that many preachers and teachers should, should be compensated for their work by God's people, by the church, just like they were in Israel before. That's why he uses the example of the Old Testament the Israel's pr priests and Levites. The laborer is worthy of his wages, and spiritual work is just as real as physical work. But for Paul, as a traveling apostle who takes the gospel into new places and who feels no freedom from God to do anything else, he desires to continue working in the regular economy as well, so as not to be a burden. That is his choice and not a necessity. Now I'm going to go on verses 19 through 23. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all so that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, although I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. So that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share in its blessings." Again, we go back to motivation, the why. Why was Paul living his life this way? And this is where I want to ask us to turn this text upon ourselves. Look at this text and hear what, what, we, what is read this morning and turn it on yourselves. This reading is not just an academic exercise, and it doesn't apply only to the narrow question of whether you pay your preacher in your church. There is also a much wider application to us, to you, to every one of you in your own sphere of life. Hear again what Paul is saying. I am free with respect to all. No. I am free with respect to all, but I have made myself a slave to all so that I might win more of them. I'm free with respect to all, but I've made myself a slave to all so that I might win more of them. He doesn't need anything from anyone. And he's not trying to get something in return. But he's willing to serve. He's willing to give. And he's willing to do this with his people, the Jews, and with everyone else, the Gentiles. Um, as he says elsewhere, he is willing to be poured out like a drink offering, have his very life's energy and life's work just be laid out on the ground for everyone to, 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 to spend himself, to even waste himself in some ways so that people may know the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, is that true of us? Is that true of us? Is it true of you? Is it true of me? You don't know me, but let me use myself as an example for a minute. I'm not like Paul. I'm a settled preacher who gets paid to work for the church. In that sense, I am like your pastor here, Jeffrey, although I am still very different. 
because I'm one pastor out of eight at a big city church rather than the sole pastor and one of, I don't know if you have any other staff members, two or three other staff members maybe, at a country church or a town church. Although I'm not like Paul, I can still see myself in this passage. Paul felt free, he felt free to serve the Corinthians and those of other cities because his bills were paid by his own hands. And, and so he could truly give a gift to the people. Well, in a similar way, those of us pastors and preachers whose, whose bills are paid by the local church, we can actually be free to serve those people in the community who are not in our church. By, by paying our salaries, the church makes us free to serve those outside the church and bring people into uh, the church, ultimately, hopefully. Um, to carry the light of Christ to our neighbors, to minister God's word in a wider forum. And I, I know that you all do that. Um, I pr again, I promise Jeffrey didn't put me up to this, but it's just where the text took us today. You all allow your, pa your pastor the freedom to spend a good deal of, of his time serving a wider world than just the towns of Nevada and Delaware. His podcast, Plain Spoken, if you haven't watched that, you really need to. That podcast is viewed by hundreds of people, uh, sometimes thousands of people on certain episodes throughout the United Methodist Church and then among di disaffiliated Methodists where churches and, and members and pastors everywhere are trying to figure out what they're going to do next. Um, that ministry that Jeffrey has is helping many, many congregations and people uh, discern the future that God is calling them to. And your pastor is free uh, from any necessity to do that work, yet he does it out of an inner drive, a compulsion from the Lord. Um, and I know that you all and your pastor have a heart for the lost people of this community. I hear uh, Jeffrey's creative ideas all the time, like with things that he wants to do and tries to do, that this, that the ministry that you have with, with uh, mothers, preparing food in the home and you know bringing people in providing them practical needs um, I know you all are trying to meet the needs of your community and that is commendable and that's what the Holy Spirit is is calling you to do but so back to myself for a minute the, the best example I can think of at the moment for me is that my big city church is allowing me the freedom to lead music at um, the inaugural annual conference of a denomination that they don't even know if they want to join yet and that's the, the Global Methodist Church, the um, conference. It's going to be Oklahoma and Kansas and Colorado and Missouri all put together. It's going to happen in Wichita, Wichita, Kansas, November 2nd through 4th. They called me and asked me to lead music, um, which uh, was an honor. And, and uh, probably because I, I can do traditional music, I can do modern music and kind of blend them. Um, but I felt uh, odd about it at first because my church wasn't in the GMC. I, I thought, should it really be me that's doing this? We need some GMC people. But I, so I'm getting people together from lots of different churches, Oklahoma Methodist churches, uh, to, to lead worship at that time. And uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. But it takes a lot of preparation. It takes hours. It takes just a lot of hard work um, to make it good and to get the people together and practice and everything. Um, but my, my church will be sending several members as observers to that conference. But at the same time, there's also ministry events going on at our church that same weekend. And I, I was released from needing to help with the first ever men's ministry camp out, for example, because my supervisors knew that my heart would be at that Global Methodist Church event, leading the people called Methodists in worship. And I appreciate the flexibility and the freedom that that gives me that the people paying my salary aren't uh, nickel and diming me, so to speak, but trust me to do the Lord's work, even if it isn't directly serving their bottom line. Anyway, enough about me and even about pastors. Back to you all. I assume that no one else in the room are preachers, although maybe some of you have been preachers before, and maybe some of you will be preachers in the future. I assume most of you all are working for a living. Farmers, tradesmen, business people, or full-time parents. Uh, we would not be reading this text properly among the people of God if we did not seek to apply it uh, to all. Where is the call of God in your life that you need to answer? Where can you become 
as Paul says, a slave to all in order to win them to Christ. Who are you called to serve? Mothers, fathers, neighbors, caregivers. What sacrifices are you being called to make to bring people to Jesus? Where is there somebody that's asking for your time? And, you know, it would just be a lot easier not to give that. Um, But it might be Jesus asking that of you. Paul became all things to all people. This was a situational thing. He couldn't actually simultaneously observe all the Old Testament dietary laws and not observe the Old Testament dietary laws. But when he was among his fellow Jews, he was very strictly observant. And when he was among Gentiles, he, he exercised freedom in those things that the Holy Spirit had told him he could be free with. I'm talking about the ceremonial laws, the dietary laws, the, the various acts of worship throughout the year, and those, those kinds of things. He wasn't free in terms of moral laws, like in the Ten Commandments. You know, those things are non-negotiable, and, and he says that, I'm under Christ's law. The things that teach us just how to treat each other, how to live, those things, you know, need to stay. And the early church dealt with that in Acts 15. You can read, read about that in Acts 15, how the apostles debated, you know, does everybody have to observe all the law or not? But Paul did everything to become as much like the Gentiles as he could in good conscience when he was with them, and to to remain as much like the Jews as he could in good conscience when he was with them. And so again, let us apply this to ourselves. Who is there in your sphere of influence whom you can, in some sense, become, become like them, so that you can win them to Christ? Who can you serve and whose world can you become part of? to shine the light of faith. Can you become like someone who grew up in poverty if you are middle class? Can you become like someone of a different ethnic group or skin color? Can you become like someone from another country with entirely different politics for whom the words conservative and liberal mean entirely different things? Can you give your time and attention to people that are very different from you Can you choose to spend significant time with those who need you, with the weak, with the poor, or just with people who are kind of strange and awkward, um, rather than those who make you feel comfortable? That might be the way to put Paul's words into practice in your life. Stretch yourself for the sake of others. Never to compromise the Bible's teaching, of course, but in any other way possible. Um... There's, a, there's a non-denominational church that some of y'all might have heard of, Life Church, that's kind of all over Oklahoma and a lot of other places. Their mission statement says something like, to do all things short of sin, to win people to Jesus. And uh, it's a memorable, uh, memorable phrase, all things short of sin. Uh, that's kind of what, what Paul was talking about. Jesus certainly went out of his way for us, sacrificing his comfort even to death on a cross. Now we're going to finish the chapter. This is verses 24 through 27. Do you not know that in a race the runners all compete, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win it. Athletes exercise self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable one. So I do not run aimlessly, nor do I box as though beating the air, but I punish my body and enslave it, so that after proclaiming to others, I myself should not be disqualified. And here we have the conclusion and the exhortation with some famous words. Run in such a way that you may win. Be in it to win it. The metaphor of a race for the spiritual life is not perfect because Of course, there is not only one winner in life. We can all win through faith in in Jesus. But the point is urgency. The race is about life and death. And the race requires training and discipline leading up to the run, the time that you compete. The, The training and discipline is worth it because what we run for is not temporary. 
It is eternal. It is not a perishable wreath like pine branches put on the head of the winning athlete, which is what he was talking about, he was referring to. It is imperishable like uh, a friend and a neighbor with whom we will spend eternity praising the Lamb of God. That's the reward that Paul was looking for is brothers and sisters to praise God with for all eternity. Others being there in heaven with him. That was his reward. Um, we know that is the kind of reward Paul is thinking of because he has already spoken of his motivations to save others. He's not talking about having a bigger mansion in glory, having higher status. He's talking about knowing that he has brought in the harvest and plowed the ground for others to harvest, and seeing the saints and martyrs in eternity when all things have been made new. Like in the book of Revelation, over and over again, periodically you see this picture of all the saints and martyrs praising God. That picture you know, was in Paul's mind, a similar idea. Uh, seeing the saints and martyrs in eternity when all things have made new, some of whom even now are the ones suffering and dying for their faith, and then others, even now, are persecuting the church, just like Paul himself used to do. But some of those, even, are going to be saved, because they're going to hear the gospel of Christ and respond in faith. And that kind of reward is worth fighting for. Now, what about this part about being disqualified? I could very well skip this part and say we're out of time, but I would be remiss to do that. I'm afraid I've got to get into a little controversial point of Methodist doctrine for a moment. Um, I was reading through a particular commentary on my Bible software, uh, preparing for this time, and came across a very curious statement about this text, the part about being disqualified. It said, it said, here Paul is not addressing the issue of salvation. Hmm, not addressing the issue of salvation. Really? But then it gave absolutely no backup for that claim. Uh, personally, I don't buy it. I, I, think, that's, uh, I think that's a cop-out. A dodging the force of the biblical text out of a misguided desire to comfort God's people, but ultimately based on human tradition. Now, as disaffiliated Methodists, we're used to the kind of cop-outs and dodges that, uh, that liberals do, you know, that, that progressive Christians do, ducking and dodging around the texts that say Jesus is the only way to salvation, or, or ducking and dodging around the texts that say that certain sins that our culture loves are still sinful and wrong. You guys know what I'm talking about? So we're used to that sort of thing and calling that and saying, no, that's wrong. Um, but uh, my friends, I, I also warn you to be on the lookout for the kind of dodges and avoidances that conservative Bible Belt Christians can also do, or you know, your, fa your favorite denomination that you grew up can also be guilty. All denominations do this. We're all guilty of reading Bible texts and saying, oh, that doesn't mean what it, what it says. I'm going to find a different meaning for that. Um, so I know I'm stepping on some toes here, but I can do that because I'm here today and gone tomorrow, and you can complain to Jeffrey about it later. And, uh, but the whole idea of once saved, always saved, that is not a scriptural teaching. It claims to make sense of certain biblical texts, but in doing so, it makes a mess of others. And it just misses their force and dodges them, this text being one of them. I'm going to read it again, and I want you to hear the passion in Paul's voice. I do not run aimlessly, nor do I box as though beating the air, but I punish my body and enslave it, so that after proclaiming to others, I myself should not be disqualified. My friends, here's what Paul was worried about. He was not worried that he would sin once, mess up, and lose his salvation. Okay, that's not how we lose our salvation. That's a misunderstanding. No, that's not what any Christian denomination believes. Although, you know, some people might have that idea. Um, nor was he trying to earn his salvation. Okay, and just believing you can lose your salvation is not the same as believing you have to earn it. It's two different things. Salvation is by faith, by trust in Jesus. And only by Jesus' work on the cross are we forgiven and set on the right path 
the path that leads to life. However, if we do not persist in faith, if we do not persist in faith holding on to Jesus, then we can indeed be disqualified. We have to keep believing, keep trusting in Jesus. We don't have to get everything right, okay? We, we, but we have to keep trusting in Jesus. And so the self-discipline is not to make ourselves perfect or to earn our salvation, but it is to keep ourselves focused, focused on Jesus, because he is our salvation. And when we fall into sin, if we do not repent, but if we just wallow in it, that can indeed take our focus off Jesus and it can injure our faith. And over time, that spiritual injury may lead to spiritual death. If you don't believe what I'm saying here based on what you have been taught in other churches, that's fine, I understand. Uh, I would ask you to please test this belief with the rest of Scripture. Let it motivate you to do a bunch of Bible study. Um, and places I would point you are Ezekiel 18 um, and Jeremiah 18 and Romans chapter 11. If you want to write that down, Ezekiel 18, Jeremiah 18, Romans chapter 11, as well as the words of Jesus in Matthew 24, 13. The one who endures to the end shall be saved. The one who endures to the end shall be saved. So I, I believe that Paul was worried here about two levels of disqualification. One, he was worried about being disqualified completely from the race, making a shipwreck of his faith, being drawn away by the world, the flesh, and the devil. Perhaps that was only a remote possibility for Paul, but it, it was certainly a possibility for his readers. And I dare say that most of you have known people who have lost their faith. Um, in most cases, there's still hope of return because Jesus is always pursuing his children to win them, to grow them, and to win them back when they wander. But it is possible, it is tragic as it is, for a believer to walk away from faith, to choose to love worldliness and selfishness over loving God and our neighbor in a way that becomes final. If it were not possible, there would not be so many warnings in the New Testament about it. But aside from that most severe possibility, Paul was also worried about being disqualified, as in still saved, but failing to fulfill and carry out what he had called his charge or his commission in verse 17. Jesus did all the work for our salvation, and Jesus is quite willing to forgive us whenever we sin and mess things up and come to him for forgiveness. We can mess up quite a bit and still be saved in the end. Paul calls this being saved as if through fire, way back in chapter 3, verse 15. Thanks be to God, he is merciful. He is always ready to receive us like the father receives the prodigal son. The new heaven and the new earth will be glorious places to be, regardless of whether we reap a great reward or we are just saved through fire. However, Jesus does have work for us to do, work that may have eternal consequences leading to the salvation of others or bringing glory to God in other ways. And that work can be compromised if we do not discipline ourselves. For his service. Only you know the state of your hearts today. I'm just a visitor for a day. As our time of worship draws to a close, I urge you to lay your hearts out before the Lord. Ask him to purify you. Ask him to redirect you for his service so that you may be his faithful servant, so that you may, may be fully his servant and carry out the charge that he's given to you. The charge that he's entrusted to you in your family, in your work, in your neighborhood, and among God's church. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.